let's go ahead and get started. Uh, this is the OKD Working Group meeting for July 19th, 2022. Please put your name in the attendees section if you could, that way we know if you were here uh, or not, uh, if we need to get important information to you. And uh, take about 30 seconds to look at the agenda if you haven't already, and let us know if there's anything you'd like to add, change, modify, move, uh, whatever. So take about 30 seconds to do that, please. Is Brian Cook supposed to be coming back again to talk about the um, the building? Uh, I don't think so. I think that was a cut and paste error by um, okay. someone who added something uh, the other day. So I. Okay. Yeah, I think that's the only thing I would change. I think he talked at the last one about that. Yeah. And is Marco actually here today to talk about the uh, playbooks? Let me just, if not, he's not answering the call right now. I'll give him a second and I'll hang him while you keep motoring on here. All right, let's uh, keep uh, motoring on. So let's do uh, release updates with, uh, let me change this, Vadim. Um, sure. Um, last week, we released another Fortran stable. I don't think there has been anything, any significant changes. We're still on F35. Most of the focus right now is on 4.11. Um, OCP has reached the release candidate stage, so we might want to promote the next 4.11 as a stable release for OKD. That should give us the door 36. That should give us a uh, Stable Fedora Core as a basis, and, uh, and so on and so forth. I don't think any significant features are landing this release, but we have a fix for bare metal installation that should make it work on OKD natively. And a uh, few more bugs were found related to Qbeard. Hopefully, F36 would fix it. Uh, the installing QBird on latest OKD seems to break uh, Linux policies. I'll uh, drop a link to the bug in the chat later on. Uh, so hopefully moving to Fedora 36 should, um, should fix it. Um, apart from that, we, uh, mostly Christian, was working with um, a whole bunch of folks at Red Hat, and we have um, CentOS 9 base image so that you can rebuild parts of OKD using that. Um, to simplify this work, we prepared a bunch of build configs for most of the components um, which are rebuildable for OKD so that it would be easy for you to find the reference how to do that. Uh, most of them are fairly straightforward. Just take the Docker file and use the CentOS 9 provided uh, builder as a base. Uh, for some, you need to replace the Docker file because those were written for RHEL 8. Uh, some contain bugs which are fairly trivial, so we would need to work with upstream to do that. And I tried to rebuild the whole OKD payload using this, but uh, I don't think I succeeded. It failed on some multis problems, so we'll keep on digging. But in general, that would be useful for both OKD and OCP because eventually we'll move to uh, RHEL 9 base for all the packages, and having this tested beforehand would be incredibly valuable and show uh, both to the community and to Red Hat engineers why OKD is uh, such a cool thing. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. Um, since we have this as a uh, bunch of build configs and uh, Tecton pipeline. This is where we can work with operate first folks and provide some kind of interface or a community cluster for uh, folks from the community to log in, build their own versions of OKD and proceed further. So once we have this stabilized, we can start working with them on how to approach this. I think resources and the authentication would be the largest problems, but I'm pretty confident we can tackle this. Um, and I think that's pretty much it from, from the release side. 
Thanks. Any questions or feedback uh, for Fadim? For Fadim for Quick update on the Marco Braga thing. Um, looks like he's out of office until the 25th, so we may have pre prematurely put him on the agenda um, and he's not answering, yeah. Well, he got bounced a couple of times, so I wanted to hold a place for him. Vadim, I do have a question for you. Is it, from an engineering, engineering perspective, does it sound reasonable that moving to the CentOS based or in having a CentOS based OKD deployment would mean that OKD could finally support FIPS? So I'll take this one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the way FIPS work, well, as I know and as far as I understand the complexity of the whole thing, is that uh, to have something FIPS certified, you submit a lot of paperwork to a certain government entity in the US uh, about how your cryptography stack uh, is implemented and what it does and things like that. So. Uh, right now, uh, Tom, it, like if we want to have anything based on CentOS stream cryptography stack, which is essentially OpenSSL, uh, be FIPS 35, we need someone to submit that um, as uh, with all the paperwork to uh, NIST, I think, if I remember correctly. Uh, I don't think that it's going to happen in as part of the work uh, that Radar does because essentially when you ship something like that and you want to have it certified, you don't want to have the whole stack change uh, frequently. So it works for well because because well updates are should be only critical fixes or uh, bug fixes that act for a specific release so a given specific version of the crypto package that would be certified would stay the same for a given rel release so the certification itself would would, would be uh, yeah. preserved yeah quote unquote uh, for central stream change app changes happen as they go as they come so when does the certification lose its meaning? I don't know. It's probably up to NIST to answer that. Uh, but um, as far as I know, there are no plans to do that. So anybody that wants to do that is obviously free to do it. But uh, yeah. That well, was so from an engineering standpoint, let's. Uh, uh, hmm. All right, so yeah, I'm familiar with FIPS in, in the, I do with it in my job each day. And so it's actually been one of the reasons why I can't use OKD in production because we are a FIPS shop uh, in terms of production release. Um, all right, that's interesting, something to-, to Something to, no to noodle on for a little while. Once we get to a stable release process for it, you know, a partner or a member of the OKD working group could take that on, or we could create a subgroup to do it, but it would be a constant cycling through each sure. for each release. Maybe what we would do is tag a single release that was super stable and do that, and you know, but it's, you yeah. know, it's, it's time. The and paperwork it's, thing is, yeah, go ahead. That's it, it's time and resources. Yeah, the paperwork thing is, you know, one aspect, but from an engineering perspective, I think is, I was asking from that because it's, um, basically it's, it's making sure that you have, right, those modules that are certified. And I don't, um, I don't know that that would change a lot. I mean, does it, do, do those, does that change a lot in Fedora in general? I don't know. I don't, I don't pay close enough attention. So the, the the general idea is that uh, essentially CentOS stream is the next role. So everything that goes into CentOS stream will be into real at some point. So the crypto stack that is in CentOS stream 
is really close to what will be in rel. The whole point of FIPS is a political and administrative process, uh, much more than the technical ones. So, yeah, you can get away saying I'm using something really close to the real thing, which is FIPS certified, but uh, it's well, you you can't though, really, not in the U.S. anyway. Like yeah. it has to be. Yeah, you can't get yeah, it. All right. Yeah, anyway. That's, yeah. Yeah, I think that was. That's, that's the short answer. I think it's something we could consider doing in the future when we have it. You know, when it's real and when the process is there, then yeah. But um, it would take like another subgroup and someone dedicated to, you know, resubmitting on a regular basis these FIPS things and. I don't think we're there yet, but a third party might, you know, maybe, you know, something like Dato or somebody wanted to be in the business of doing that and having a release that was FIPS compliant, you know, maybe they, they would do that and do it as a business or something. I, I don't know who's crazy enough to do that, but hey, <laughs> some, right, of us, right. some, of us, some of us are. Yeah, okay. you might end up. You might end up spending more than your OpenShift subscriptions to. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. <laughs> that is true. Uh, okay, moving on to uh, the Fedora Core OS updates. Hang on, Jim, Jimmy, before you do that, there's a question from Leroy in the chat. Yes. So oh, yeah, Leroy. We, yeah. We, we're talking about oh, read back here. the question. Uh, Timothy, read back the question as well. For yes, the there. question is, is the idea to use CentOS Stream as a base for cluster operations, or is it to use CentOS Stream as a host node OS? So there's two things. Uh, there's one thing that has that uh, Valin talked about uh, before, which is using CentOS Stream images, container images to build OKG, which is something that is only done on the build infra side to generate the OKD payloads, the thing that you install in the end, the end containers. So that's, he's doing that right now. Then there's the CentOS Stream Chorus work, which is still in progress. I was going to talk about that, which is adding an option for OKD to run on top of CentOS Stream Chorus instead of Fedora Chorus uh, for a specific, for cluster deployment. So control plane and worker nodes. Yeah, so is there a third gonna... question, which is using CentOS Stream instead of UBI for base images? This option is on the table, but that would bring us back to the OKD three days where we had to rebuild every single container which gets us from, from OCB. We do not need to do this on a daily basis. We would rather just take them verbatim from OCB. But for the community, we tell them, hey, we're building them based on UBI and some are built on top of RHEL because we need packages like Open Speech and, uh, and SDN and things like OVN and things like that. But you are able to build them using your, uh, UBI, most of the cases, and the rest you should be able to build them using. That's what we're trying to prove here. But we probably won't be using them because it's, uh, it just makes life harder for us. As for the host node OS, this option is on the table, but I'm not sure which benefit does it bring to us. Like when it's fairly clear what Fedora gives us when it compared to RHEL, it gives us uh, stream kernel, it gives us fresh packages update. It's not clear what CentOS stream gives us. Uh, it doesn't give us bit to bit compatibility to RHEL. And it doesn't give us fresh enough packages. It kind of, it doesn't. We don't see the benefit of it at this point. But it's still, of course, discussable. Uh, uh, why we want this experiment so that we could prove that OKD is experimentation platform, and you can turn it into whatever you want to. And it's helpful for OCP. That means we get more trust from from the engine. But it probably would be just a CI level experimentation thing. It probably won't become upstream because it doesn't give us really any. Uh, again, all of these bits are uh, on the table and possible. We just want to show how flexible OKD is. Okay, Leroy, did 
I think this is stuff that would go into a nice little FAC item. I'll bring it to the docs meeting. I think at this point we should start the documentation working group or community outreach working group or whatever we're going to call it. Maybe should put something together that talks about this project a little bit and maybe shed some light on it so that we can prepare folks because it sounds like we're getting close to something being available. Okay, moving on now to... We did FCOS updates, documentation subgroup updates. Brian? We could do quick FCOS updates, but... Oh, sorry. No problem. I don't have much, so it won't take long. The first one is a link to this week, this month in Fedora Cores, which made true addition that we've had it S3 E90X images in Fedora Cores, but I don't think we have S3 90X OKD builds right now. So, well, the base is here. The next might come later. And the second item is that, yeah, we've talked about CentOS Stream Cores in previous meetings. It's still work in progress right now. It's blocked on engineering, on working on it. Uh, and uh, hopefully we can give an update uh, at some point later. And um, just there was, and I apologize, I've been um, offline for a couple of days. I think it was Peter Hunt, who is on the call now, um, was um, working on that blocker um, for you. Um, so, uh, Peter, I don't know if you're on the call and can chime Hello. in. Hello. What the Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, so uh, I don't have a huge status update. We, the cryo community has had a couple of requests for EL9 builds, and we haven't um, gotten there yet. Um, I want, uh, we had talked on some forum, I don't remember which forum, about having an OKD working group within CentOS, um, which would give us a place to build the packages for cryo and cry tools and um, the cubelet. Um, but so probably need to chat a little bit about that. But um, yeah, I don't have any uh, specific updates because we have to kind of determine where we're going to be putting the packages and uh, exactly how we're going to build those up. So Mike is asking a question in chat. Yep. Yeah. Just before you're a little bit loud, Peter, if you could reduce a little bit of the volume, that would be great. Mike is asking, yeah, Kublet be built as a an RPM? Um, so yes. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, right now, right now, yes. Right now, uh, Kublet uh, will be built as an RPM. Cryo needs to be built as an RPM and included into SCOS. Maybe in the future we could use chorus layering to uh, avoid that and directly. But we'll still need to have RPMs, but uh, or maybe not. Maybe not. But well, right now yeah. we need it. That's that's another thing that I was kind of thinking. Uh, we could avoid having uh, any any official place to put the packet. Like we don't need the CentOS working group necessarily if we create, um, you know, I forget what those copper a copper repo and have the um, a layer pull from the copper repo and build on top of SCOS. And I, I mean, I think that that uh, could end up being an idiomatic way of handling the packages. And I wanted to talk about that because that could be easier than, you know, having the full working group and um, getting to do all the, the paperwork for all of that. Is it, is it something that you could have a, a subgroup Underneath the OKD working group, or is it, does it necessarily have to be in in the CentOS? I would like to start creating a collaboration bridge with the CentOS community. So I'm, you know, I'm open to. I'm personally, I'm not speaking for the working group, interested in, in how we do that and reach out to the CentOS folks to make them aware that this is happening. What would your suggestions be, Peter? Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, so so the, the thing that we have to determine is how officially we want to ship Cryo in CentOS. Because, like, so for instance, in Fedora now, we're shipping it as a module. 
Um, that has been cumbersome for me as the packager to put together the cryo packages. And it's not exactly matching what we do with OpenShift proper because we're the, the cadence of our release in a release branch is too frequent for an official package system like you know the Fedora packaging system. Um, whereas if we had a copper repo, we could just you know put whatever we want in there, um, and that would just be pulled straight to the um, you know built on top of the release image. So it kind of like I'm open to any level of collaboration, but I think generally what we need to determine is like if we want these cryo, the cryo RPM to be generally available in uh, CentOS or if it if we want to build it more special for OKD and I kind of lean towards the latter. There. Yeah, uh, it's a little bit up to you, like if how much you want to support uh, folks, but uh, I would mean also to the later, like if you want to start and focus only the OKD, OKD first, then yeah, we could probably make a copper somewhere in the Fedora Infra and have you push changes there, and we use that will as cost for now, and we'll see uh, if other folks want to take up maintenance or make up a centralist uh, working group, then they are free to do so too. So yeah, yeah, and 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 Mike, to that point, uh, we have some people who are using. It on CentOS right now we build through uh, OpenSUSE's uh, build system OBS um, and people install on CentOS with that. It doesn't yet support CentOS nine, so we wouldn't be able to use it for that quite yet. Um, basically, what the Cryo community has is a lack of time to put into packaging, and there's all these different packaging solutions for all these different distributions that our users need, and the more one-offs that we had that have the higher the uh, burden of packaging becomes, which is why, you know, it's my preference to have it. I, you know, my ideal would be it, the, it would be pulled directly from OBS or something, or like some auto build service that we create um, to reduce our overhead because we're already spread really thin. Um, Vadim, according, uh, the Typhoon went with Container D on Fedora Core OS because of our, of the troubles that we have packaging. And I, it's really like a bandwidth problem that like my team is only a couple people and right. we have all, you know, fun, just spread too thin. The only thing, and, and uh, a lot of what you said to me just then was um, a lot of acronyms and a lot of places. Um, so I'm just say that out loud. The thing that, that I worry about and we've done in the past is had things that were, you know, specific build for OKD and then we, um, you know, Vadim has done a tremendous amount of work keeping us in a release path. That, and I just, the more that this could be, and I know it's the burden of the resources of creating this package can be just part of the automated build of Cryo and I understand resources are thin, the better it, this will be. Um, not that you shouldn't do what's going to work for this first MVP, um, but I long term it never works out for us to have something that's custom for OKD. It always ends up being on uh, some poor sod like uh, Vadim's lap or you know Mike or somebody doing something special like Carol and his wonderful snowballs of things. Um, yeah, it's it just. The more it can just be part of the cryo release process and packaged up, the better. And if I need to go in and um, sit and arm wrestle with Dan Walsh or somebody, <laughs> let me let me know. Um, he'll win, but um, he'll do it if I have to, you know, jump up and down. But do what you need to do to get to the MVP, um, which is you know this first release of it. And um, then let's not but let's try not to make it little custom things for OKD. If possible. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so, in, in the meantime, we can set up some sort of temporary repo to build Cloud directly to. Um, I'll try to include that in the release process, and then we'll think long term about the ways that we can reduce the burden of packaging, you know, separately for CentOS and 
but are in all these other places too. Excellent, that's fantastic, Peter. Oh, by the way, we have a policy if there's a guest uh, on video that you have to introduce them. Uh, who is your guest, Peter? Uh, this is Kit Kat, um, and she, every time I talk, she decides, she remembers that I exist and wants attention, so. <laughs> that's yes. how that works. All right, thank you. Any further questions for Timothy or Peter on this? Thanks, Peter. Yeah, thank you. Yep, yeah, thank you. All right, and sorry, Timothy, that I sort of skipped over <laughs> when we got diverted, I apologize. All good. Uh, okay, let's move now to the um, documentation subgroup updates with Brian. Okay, so we've got quite an interesting discussion last weekend. Um, <clears throat> first one is the actual re repo move. So we actually have some use of the OKD project GitHub repo. And it's now trying to line up the Red Hat resources to move the OpenShift and the OpenShift MCS repos, which is the OKD.io and the main OKD repo. Um, <clears throat> we are going to do a, a move rather than try and sort of copy, because that means everything goes, the discussion groups, the um, the issues, everything just moves across to one. So we need the Red Hatters that control the DNS um, to actually switch the OKD.io across. And then we also need a Red Hatter that can actually do the move, that has the authority to actually um, pass over the repos from the OpenShift and the OpenShift CS organizations to the OKD project. So we need to sort of do the cap herding to get these people together, set a time, do the move. Um, so I'm sort of looking in Diane's direction. To I know, I can see those eyes coming. Right. And I take, <laughs> I take the poor sod who's in, in charge of that, Will Gordon, um, and we've been going back and forth. I think he was on vacation a little bit last week. Um, Will Gordon and Jerry Falla are the two um, that I rely on for that. Um, and I would also had asked the Will to track down the um, MX stuff, too, for the email address. So um, I think you guys have his email, Will Gordon. So maybe yes. um, reach out to him with a little email, CC me, I'll make him answer. Um, and let's find a time that we can just do it and get this off of our plates. Um, he, would be, he would be the person. The MX one, he was asking legal for one more sign off of something and I'll, I'll check in with him on that too. But yeah, it's Will Gordon and the other person is Jerry, Jerry Fala. And I, Jerry Fala will be problematic because he's on, he's, I think he's in the Czech Republic. And um, so his time zone's not quite great. Okay, and then the Red Hatters, is it Vadim? Christian for the OpenShift org and the OpenShift underscore CS org. Might be, Vadim, you might still have privileges to do that. I don't think I can do this directly, but there is a team which manages GitHub repos, so I can uh, ask them to do this. And I think I can find Yuri Fiala uh, if, he's, if we need to talk to him. Yeah. And um, okay. Will Gordon basically owns OpenShift.cs, so which is different. That's for customer success, because we use customer okay. success everywhere. Charles. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so hopefully in the next week or so we can get that done, which means that will then be within the OKD dash project um, GitHub organization. So everything. Um. So the next thing is we had a discussion around what are currently the guides. So um, we've got a number that are outdated. There's a couple that we're going to change to blogs. Um, but I think we need to have the discussion around, and I noticed, Jamie, you, you, you raised a discussion item as well in terms of how do we help people get started? Because we had a discussion that the docs.okd.io are great once you've got over the hurdle of doing your first install and you understand all the terminology, 
but when you come into it fresh the first time you're just hit with a wall of acronyms and and choices that you may not be able to actually make a an informed decision about so is that the role of the guide so so we had a discussion about what should the guides be and um, a lot of them are out of date so i mean there is the one about the the unofficial sno based back in 4.7 time frame we've now got the official sno so again things need to be updating so there's some work to be done there and, and we need to get that done um we then had quite a discussion with the with the work going on with things like um <clears throat> the discussion from brian cook last week on the what's it called the red hat hybrid application cloud being an early adopter and then there's also the possible operate first cloud and the community having a build environment outside the Red Hat firewall. And um, we talked about, which is the next item, so I'll cover this now as well, the operators as a community, we are looking to build an OKD catalog. Um, Red Hat engineers haven't found the time to actually go and create that for us. So as a community, we're looking to enable the community to build that catalog of Red Hat operators as they appear in the OCP product. That would be a community built catalog. Um, so we're looking at what is the overall governance. We've now got our OKD project repo. Um, I think Christian's gone and created a key.io um, project that we can use to actually host images. So it's all around the project management, the governance. Um, We've heard, and I certainly experienced it, when new people want to join the community, it's difficult for them to find out how they can contribute, what needs doing. We don't have an activity or a project board. So it's quite difficult to actually join the community and feel that it can be um, useful and where you can be useful. I was lucky that I could offer the MK Docs conversion, and that's how I sort of got into the community. And then once you get to know people, it's easier to to be feel that you're part of the community but there's no way of actually doing that a lot of projects have the good first um task or good first activity flag so we need to look at things like that so i have put a discussion um up today i'm going to put a link in the chat and we can also put that in the the minutes um and I really just want to have a, a discussion and get people's ideas just to work out how do you want to do this. We're also aware that although we do have quite a big community, we are a very small group of active non-red hatters within the community that actually do things. Um, so we also need to be careful that we don't take on too much or we actually try and build that community. Um, so a lot of discussions to be had around the community governance and then also with the operators um last week was red hat project i forget what, what the official term is and christian found a team that actually went and created a tecton pipeline so if you look in the okd project you'll see there is a repo where they actually published a tecton pipeline to build a generic operator and the idea is that we want to pick on that, create this hackathon um, to actually kick off a community, building that out and, and maybe picking off some more operators. Um, I think that's it. I did see a hand go up. Mike. Diane, did you want to go first? It looked like you were raising no, you, your hand. You go ahead. I didn't do the official hand raise, so you go. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Brian, I'm curious a little bit, like, I'm I'm intensely curious about helping to bridge the gap for developers who want to contribute to OKD. Um, and so I'm curious, like, what could we do to help? I realize getting started can mean different things for different people, but, like, what could I do or what could we do as Red Hatters to help in creating materials for, like, that you know, I'm a developer, I've come to OKD, like what's my next step? Because like, 
it's going to be a really long time before we have a board that says, oh, here's a good issue you could look at. Like, you know how it is. All the projects are yeah. separated. We don't do our planning in GitHub. So the question is, yeah. like, is there material or could we create like a video series or could we could we do something where we're helping to show users like this is how you set up OKD. This is how you might find something to work on. Like and maybe this is a better topic for the docs meeting, but I just I just wanted to kind of like I want to figure out how no, I can get more directly involved there. OK, so th there's two things. So th what we were talking about with the guides, I think that's exactly that. So somebody who wants to use OKD. I think that the getting started experience we need to look at. And I think you're right, video. I did my first install by looking at a video guide. Um, it was the easiest way for me to get going. So I, I think things like that are a great help. Um, I think the operators, because getting started now, once you've got the core platform, you end up with this, you're then stuck because if you want to do Tekton or GitOps, or run the code ready workspaces or whatever they're called, dev workspaces now, or you want to do some storage or you want to have an S3 bucket. These are all operators which are there for for OCP, but at the minute we don't have. So I think that's another sticking point that, yeah, I've got my first, my first cluster up and running. Oh, but everything I want to do on it, there isn't the operator that I need to actually make it that easy. So I think that's where the community operator comes in. Um, I have created a technical documentation section, so that's where I'm trying to pull the things together in terms of if you're a developer and you want to help, how do you actually build an operator? How do you build a bit of, how do I do a bit of debugging? How do I do this? So if you can help with that technical section now, I've been bugging Christian um, for actually putting the the Docker files for build images so someone can actually see what's in it and how it works. So we've now put that in the OKD project repo. Um, so it, trying to expose resources that are hidden or obscure in terms of finding what they are within Prow and the, the internal CI. I mean, all the transformations that go on there, it's really difficult to actually understand what a build, how a build works. So anything you can do to help there, contribute documentation is probably for a technical point of view. And yet within the documentation group, we do need to look at that getting started experience. What needs to be written, what should be videos, or what are the resources? Um, yeah. Diane, you had your hand up. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not muted. Um, so Austin McDonald, who is leads the operator SDK work and um, is basically the de facto community manager for the operator framework um, from the Red Hat side of things. Um, and I have been talking about not just doing an OKD SCOS hackathon, but also doing an operator, a hackathon on this. And I think that's what this um, Tekton pipeline that they did during what's called Shift Week last week um, is a starting point for. So um, one, like we did years, it feels like years ago, um, for the deployment and the testing and getting the videos out of that, uh, trying to put together um, this, I call them hackathons, they're probably misnomers, but like a, a series of like, this is how the Tekton pipeline works. This is and maybe an intro of what is the operator framework, specifically for working on OKD stuff. And Austin is totally game to do that and to do some cross collaboration between the operator framework community and, and they have some resources. And then to pull in maybe the authors or the current maintainers of those operators that we want to give, to own a track in that hackathon so that they could explain what it was to the OKD folks. People could answer, you know, ask questions of them and maybe connect the dots and maybe hopefully get those maintainers of those operators actually own some of the process um, or at least the feedback on that. And that was. The thinking and then I can edit the shizzle out of all those videos and get them up and you can use them on the in the documentation and blog post. That that was my that's the best game plan I can do aside from writing them all myself and maintaining them for the rest of my natural life, which is not gonna happen. <laughs> I think the video thing is interesting as a simple sort of baseline project. 
what might be cool is literally a welcome to the OKD community type video. A little three to five minute thing that's like, these are our meetings. This is what happens at our meetings. These are where the docs are. This is where, you know, people contribute or whatever. And actually just have that as a, as a video that we feature maybe on the website or something so that there's a, a walkthrough of what the community even is without having to read through a paragraph and then try to follow all the resources and whatever. So I'd be willing to do something like that to get us started in the video realm. I think video is the place to be. We have our meetings, but we don't really have, and mm -hmm. we've got some of the presentations and stuff like that and, and um, you know, so, commons videos. Jimmy, if you want to think about what the outline of that would be, and maybe, I mean, I'm happy to edit the shizzle if, if you want to do it, and I, you know, we can interview it. Um, we can do an interview style or just talking style and make it. I've done a couple of what is OKDs in the past for different events, um, and you know, down to four or five minutes. But I think a walkthrough of even, you know, flip sharing your screen, showing, okay, this is where the documentation is. I know this is confusing. These are guides. This is the blog. This is the OKD.io docs. That sort of thing. And um, you know, we can do a couple takes of it, and I can edit it. Happy to do that. I'll start working on a script and I'll put a discussion item up for a yep. script and then folks can can uh, join me and sort of hacking away at it and we can come up with something. I think that'd be kind of cool because... I know, would love we, it if it's not me that's the talking head, that it's an external um, participant. Um, so that would be great for me. The so, one thing I would say is that it might be good to get someone who isn't me and who isn't maybe the people on this call, because I don't know if you noticed, but if you look at, there's a there's a common denominator in, in the participation of, uh, of this working group, meaning there's a lot of people who are all sort of the same, from the same bent, right? And I think it would be nice, particularly if we could get, um, you know, some people from, from different perspectives and also, um, maybe get more of a of a uh, female presence uh, in the community. I think that would be helpful. Yeah. No, I think we we could find somebody, um, and if we if we build a script, but um, if we to do a first take and walk through, Jamie, as you as the the chair of the working group right now, might yeah. be nice to have the first one, and then we can do little side events here too. But I do I would like to promote awareness of you being our point person now too. According to Christian the other day, he was fumbling for words. He was like, he's the, the lead of the working group. You're chairing. Um, <laughs> Buddy, you are chairing it now. I'm like, you're, you're trying to flag everything else down. But yeah, you're, I'm, I'm, I'm. All right. So we've got some great ideas. Let's make sure we document them. And I want to acknowledge that Brian has been just, just kicking ass and doing some great work. Brian, thank you so much for... You've lifted up the group so much in, in just the short time that you've been involved with all this stuff and really been valuable. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. So next up is customizing OKD. And if Vadim is still on, Vadim, if you want to just highlight your comment that you put in the notes and explain this a little bit more, um, uh, feel free. Um, but basically, it was sort of riffing on. So how do you know? What commit uh, the repo uh, that the repo was built from points to the commit that this was built from when you're looking at um, source repositories for images. So, Vadim, go ahead and and maybe walk us through that a little bit. Yeah, basically, there's a command called OC admin input and it has all the information fetched from the build images, which you contain uh, a list of images included in the OD3. Oh, Is it better now? I think it's still in my hand. Still breaking up, yeah. Uh, just so you know, that is a, that's now actually on the, in the docs, the OKD docs. Um, I'll put a link in the technical section. Excellent. I, I, I did get to write that in. <laughs> so it seems like you'll write a blog post instead. There we go. All 
All right. Well, that's good. And so Brian has something up, but if Vadim, if you want to flesh it out, that would be fantastic. If you have the time, we would very much appreciate that. Um, so basically, yeah, there is a way to find out more details about where it came from. And I think that that is really um, important. Uh, I think the, the, yeah. sorry, just to get the other point that Jack raised last time was, is there a way to actually link a feature and understand what I see on screen, where does that live? What, what operator is looking after that bit? Because I think there was also within CERN, they had some issues where they knew what they wanted to change, but they weren't, they couldn't figure out which operator or which bit of the source code managed that bit of functionality. So I think that was one of his other, which, which I think is the, the last bullet point um, in the agenda, how to determine if an OCP feature is in OKD. I think that was linked up, linked with that in terms of, okay, so I, I actually understand the feature, but how do I link that to a bit of source or a module? So I think that was another question that I didn't have an answer for. So if there's an easy way to do that, um, I don't know. Yeah, this is something I brought up at the meeting, maybe before you were even on, uh, on the group, Brian, but the idea that like, we don't have anything that says, oh, when you need to look at logging, where, where are the logging pods? When you need to look at, you know, alert manager, where are the actual alert manager pods? So you can look at logs and stuff like that. Um, Mike, do you know of anything, or Vadim, do you know of anything that, oh, um, oh Vadim's still there, okay. Um, do you know of anything that's like a matrix of like this functionality, this OpenShift functionality translates to this operator? Is there any such an existing document? We, I do not think there is. We've talked about something like that internally. I, you know, for those of you of a certain vintage, you might remember Microsoft used to distribute this class hierarchy as a poster when you bought like the old Microsoft Foundation classes. We talked about trying to make something like that with OKD or with uh, OpenShift where you could see what all the operators do and kind of like which parts they go into. But I don't think we have anything currently that's just like a quick reference. I mean, there are some spreadsheets available to talk about operators and kind of list everything there. But I think it's really difficult currently to like look at something happening on a cluster and then just pinpoint where does that come from without kind of like an understanding of like the base level operators that build it up to begin with. Once you start to understand like the the resource objects, you know, the, the Kubernetes resource objects that are associated with the actions you're looking at, that usually can become kind of like a trail to help you follow back. Because once you figure out what the object is, then you can start to figure out, is there an operator that owns this object? And if there's an operator that owns this object, that's probably the one that's doing most of the reconciliation work on it. You know, so like it's a little bit right now, it's a little bit of a Sherlock Holmes kind of thing, you know, where it's like I see something happening and I saw some object that I didn't recognize. OK, where did that object come from? And then if you look in the etcd records, you can oftentimes see if there's an owner reference, you know, and if there's an owner reference, that gives you another breadcrumb to start tracing back. But like. I think that's the manual process of doing it. I, I haven't seen anything that like makes it explicitly clear where all these things, maybe, maybe the DEM has though. No, it's it's more complicated because for instance, uh, scaling up new nodes is shared between autoscaler, machine API and machine config. And they are supposed to work together to give you a seamless experience. But when something breaks, Machine config says I did my best. I generated the ignition with machine API's fault, or maybe machine autoscaler didn't work. So um, it definitely would be a useful, a very rough map of what alert manager is in monitoring operator, but it probably won't be a very detailed one. And we keep on adding new things, um, so it's a really complicated job. We definitely need. What would be useful, uh, something for the beginners, like here's what you get. Monitoring solution, including alerting, uh, observation on dashboards, Prometheus, and a high level overview of the components would certainly be useful for the people to try. But Mike is correct, once you get on a more complicated level, 
its operators all the way down. Once you find out which CR is responsible for this, you would know which operator is reconciling it, and uh, and on and on and on. I'd be so, willing to... Oh, go ahead. Just to, yeah, just to add a little to what Vadim is saying there, because Vadim mentioned something that's like really important, right? He mentioned like, okay, you might have a situation where, where the cluster is growing because the autoscaler is doing something with the machine API, which is doing something with the machine config, right? But those pieces are not tightly coupled. So the key, and this is the this is something we probably need to make more explicit. The key here is Kubernetes, right? Kubernetes is the data store. You know, etcd is the data store that's keeping the common API interface. So the autoscaler, the machine API, and the machine config, they're all just reconciling their own information. And there isn't necessarily a strong binding between these components. So with our users, I think the key here is getting people to the understanding that this is still Kubernetes and the Kubernetes objects are probably the most important thing in the system. Because when you understand those objects and you start to understand the control processes that are looking at those objects, now you can start to demystify the system for yourself. I had an idea for a blog post. Uh, literally just exporting OC get CO to a table and then just have a description column that's just like, hey, what does this operator do? And literally just give someone the 1200 foot overview of like what the operators are that get installed by default on a fresh install and what they actually do. All right, um, so we have about four minutes and I have a hard stop at two. Um, are there any last minute thoughts that people wanna cover uh, before we sign off? Brian. I got one, um, it's, it's mainly because Charo's turned up. Um, what are we doing about CRC or whatever the new name of it is now? Um, because we still don't have a solution for it. <laughs> I haven't touched it in months. So I, the last I heard from the the actual, the engineering team, um, it sounded like they were actually getting close to having the ability to build an OKD release with the tooling that they have natively. I may get a wild hair and, and get in there and, and mess around with it, but right now I've been, my, my hobby focus right now has been on multi-cluster and multi-region. Uh, application type stuff. So I, I really haven't touched CRC in a long time. And I want to, we don't expect you to, and we appreciate the things that you did in the past. And I think, I think really at this point, we need to go back to that thread. The engineers in question are actually in that discussion thread in the repo. Let's talk to them yeah. directly. I, I, I don't want to burden Charo with, with this yep. any longer. You, you, Taro contributed when he could, and I and I think let's reach out to those engineers who are in that thread. Yeah, sorry, think... sorry, it, it, it wasn't as if yeah we needed to go and do it. It was more I didn't a fact take that, it that way either. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay, it's more a fact that it's broken currently, so we should either get rid of it or fix it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, documentation group will make a final decision on moving forward. I think. So, all right, that brings us to the end of the meeting. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and be sure to get all of your to-do tasks done and uh, we'll talk to you online soon. Thanks, thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Jamie.